I sh- should I make the adults stand up and do it with us? Your daddy would look silly doing Father Abraham. All right, y'all stand up. Everybody stand up. Spread out a little bit. You need a little bit of room. There you go, Allie. That's right, Allie. Get them spread out. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, chin up. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, chin up, turn around. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them. And so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, chin up, turn around. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Mike's a little dizzy. A little vertigo going on. Okay, here we go. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Hold on. Can everybody see our light when we hold it down here real close? No, we have to get it up here, right? Let's hold it up. All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Hiding under a bushel, I'm going to let it shine. Hiding under a bushel, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Shine your light till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Shine your light till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Shine your light till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Y'all out of breath yet? All right. Well, let me ask you a question. What are some ways that we could hide our light under a bushel hide it where under the porch yeah you know we can you know when we don't take what we believe and show it to the world or say it to the world it's like hiding our light under the porch or under the bushel or maybe just when god's people are around we have to show the world who we are right That's what Jesus said. Let your light shine before men. So that's one of the ways. What what are some of the ways we could let Satan blow it out? What are some ways we could do that? When we do what? Or maybe when we don't do what God said. We can let, like our friends are around when we get older and they're doing maybe something they shouldn't be doing or maybe they're talking about something they shouldn't be talking about and when we don't when we don't speak up and let our light shine and show who we are 
that's kind of like letting the devil blow our light out, right? All right, so that's important. We've got some questions we're going to ask tonight. A uh, couple from the Old Testament and some from the New. My question is this. Who did God tell to build the ark? Noah. That's Noah. Noah said the answer. Noah built the ark. That's right. He God told Noah to do it. That's really good, Noah. Good job. All right. Um, what was God planning to send on the upon the earth when he told Noah to build an ark? What was God going to send? No. What was he going to do to the earth? Older girls? What was God going to do? Marissa? He was going to flood the whole earth, wasn't he? And so Noah and his family with the animals were on the ark. Good. Very good. All right. Here's a New Testament question. How old was Jesus when he went to the temple? You remember? I'll give you a hint. He was young. How old was he? Marissa, how old are you, honey? Seven years old. How are you, Sophia? Eleven years old. Your next birthday, how old are you going to be? Twelve. Twelve. You're a tall twelve-year-old. I wasn't as tall as you when I graduated from high school, I'm afraid. But anyway, that's, just, that's, that's a whole other discussion. All right. How old was Jesus when he went up to the temple, Sophia? Twelve years old. He was twelve years old. As a matter of fact, this is kind of important because... We're going to talk about this a little bit tonight. We're going to hint at it. I'll try to remind you about it in our adult class in just a few minutes. There was this age when a Jewish boy, male, became a man. You know, you want to guess what it was? Marissa? I thought you said something. What did you say? You guys are so shy. Y'all are so smart. 12 years old, that's right. When, and so when Jesus was 12, he was considered a man and he was supposed to appear before the altar. He was supposed to do that three times a year. And so Jesus was 12 when he went up to the temple. Now here's the rest of that story. I want y'all to think about that. Do y'all know that story? When Jesus went to the temple for the first time with his family, remember they traveled from Nazareth in a big group. They went down there. Some of them would have had their animals with them for the sacrifices. Others would have bought them when they got there. And then when it came time for everyone to go home, what happened? Y'all know that story? That's okay, Noah. I'm talking to these older guys. When Jesus and his, or when his family returned home, where did Jesus stay? Marissa. That's right, he stayed. He was talking to the priests and the, the men in the temple. And, and they were asking him questions. They were amazed by him. All this time went by. His family was a whole day on the way home when they realized he wasn't there. And so they had to turn around and come back and look for him. And so Jesus, was, Jesus stayed behind. And you remember what Jesus said. This is important. You remember what Jesus said to his mother when she said, Why have you thus dealt with us? And Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. What did you say, Noah? Okay, I, all right. I must, I must be my father's son. That's good. Yeah, I must be about my father's business. All right, so that's our questions. Let me tell you all a little story. Tonight, in our adult class, Paul is going to talk about uh, the law of Moses and its relationship to Christians, to Jewish Christians. There's a lot of trouble in the church at Galatia. And, uh, and he's going to talk about that. And he uses this very illustration to talk about what life is like when you're a child. Let me ask you a question. Uh, let's ask Lucas a question. He's kind of quiet. Lucas, how'd you get here tonight? He came in a car. Did you drive the car? No. Who drove the car? Your dad drove the car. Why didn't you drive the car? No, he said you couldn't. You actually asked. So y'all had this question. That's not true. That's not true. He was, he was pulling your leg. That's what he was doing. I knew, that, I knew it wasn't. What, why, why, didn't, why didn't he let you drive? 
You don't have a license yet. You think you could drive, though? You think you could? They probably could. I bet you could. But you don't have a license, right? You're not allowed to do that yet. Being a kid's fun, right? You rely on your parents to take you everywhere you go, right? You just can't get in your car and go, right? You look forward to having a license, being able to go on your own, do your own thing? Well, it won't be exactly like that, do your own thing. Uh, it won't be that way, and you'll find out that being an adult's not all that you think it's cracked up to be. But anyway, uh, life is different when you're children. When you're children, you have guardians. You have someone who basically tells you where to go, what to do, where to be, how you're going to get there, when you're going to come home, all of those kinds of things. They're giving you all of these instructions. And so when you're a child, not that you are little children, not little babies like that, but you're you know, big children, uh, kids, people call them, um, you, uh, you don't get to make a lot of decisions for yourself. But when you become an adult, everything changes right, right? And you have some of these freedoms that you didn't have before. Now that's kind of important because there were people who were telling non-Jews, non Gentiles, who became Christians, that you need to go back and you need to observe the law. Well, Paul says that's kind of like telling someone who's been freed that you can go back and be a slave again to all of these rules or to the guardian who made all of your decisions in your past. And Paul said that doesn't even make sense. Well, y'all listen to that tonight in your lesson because that's going to help you as you get older to understand uh, why the New Testament makes such a, or has such a big discussion about returning to the law of Moses and why you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. That's kind of a big subject, but anyway. Let's sing the song. You guys want to you guys want to sing it? You don't. You don't want to lead it, you mean. You want to sing with me? Yes, you do. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Very good. Thank you, Knox. All right, y'all can go and sit with your, sit with your parents. All right, so y'all listen to that stuff about guardians, okay? Thank you, Knox. Good job. Thank you, Cooper. Thanks, man.
Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day that you've made, this Lord's Day, that we can be together and worship you and gather around this table to remember your son and the life that he lived and the sacrifice that he made for us all. We're thankful for the perfect plan that was preserved for us all so that we might come to know your unfading promises and the hope that we all have of a home in heaven with you one day. We're thankful for the church that meets here and the, the group that shares together a commitment to serving you and earning a home in heaven to your side. And we're thankful for all those that, that make this worship and this assembly possible and thankful for our elders and the work that they do. And we're thankful for Mike and Gwen and the work that they do, as well as the teachers that help our children to come to know you and, and serve you as they grow older. We're thankful, Lord, that we can approach you in prayer and lay our cares and burdens at your feet. And we're thankful that you hear our prayers and we know, Lord, that there are many that we uh, bring before your name, or their, are their name before you uh, often that are sick and in need of, of your care and your comfort. And we are thankful for those that have been granted a portion of their health back and can be back with us. And we know, Lord, there are still those who are in need of your care and your comfort. And we pray that you continue to be with them and, and help them to get better. We pray, Lord, that you would go with us as we worship you here this, this evening and we Pray that you'd help us to, to look to you first this week as we go about our business. And we ask you, Lord, to please forgive us where we failed you. In Christ, we pray. Amen. Turn in your Bible to uh, the book of Galatians chapter 4, We're picking up where we left off last Lord's Day evening. Uh, I would probably be embarrassed to tell you whose bright idea it was to try to teach seven-year-olds uh, the, uh, um, the point that Paul's making here in Galatians, the fourth chapter, about uh, being a child under a guardian, uh, and uh, so whether I, you think I did that uh, well or not, uh, I hope to help our adults uh, at least follow that train of thought. And I'm going to borrow a little bit uh, from some of that uh, discussion that I had with the children tonight, kind of complete that illustration. Um, I, uh, this evening, uh, want to uh, back up a little bit in the reading and start in verse 23, which is the paragraph which precedes uh, this in chapter 4, uh, and then carry the thought through so that we can follow that together. Before faith came, Paul writes, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that the faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father or by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, saying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Now stop right there for just a moment. Uh, the subject of uh, guardianship of, uh, of the Jewish nation under the law uh, is not new. 
probably to, to those in this audience, perhaps some of our young people it might be. Others who may be watching, uh, it is surely a new concept, a new consideration. But Paul takes up that discussion and describes what life was like under the guardian uh, in this particular chapter. And he's building his case. He's shown the great value of being uh, in Christ, being an heir of the promise that was made to Abraham, benefiting from the gospel that is in your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed, as we've discussed. Um, and now he's going to build his case against what the false teachers have been advocating. And, and he's really just going to show this from a common sense perspective, why this makes no sense to do what the, um, what the Judaizers are trying to compel Gentiles to do or even Jews to consider uh, in, in their course of life as New Testament Christians. He discusses this uh, heirship, if you'll let me say this. We have a funny little thing that's been going on for a long, long time in our family. When Emily was a little girl, Emily always functioned a little ahead in her thinking of where I thought she ought to think uh, when she was growing up. And one night I was talking about my intelligence to her in the car on the way home from church. And uh, I, I said to her, I'm the king. Well, Emily was, I don't know how old she was. She was a little thing. And she says, no, you're not. Jesus is the king. And so what do you say to that? I mean, what kind of comeback do you have with that? And I said, no, well, I'm the smartest man on earth. And she said, oh, no, you're not. Mr. Eastham is. That's one of the members at, at Fry Road where I live. You just really couldn't get anything over on her. Well, fast forward now. She has a little girl who's very much like her. And I have convinced uh, Evie through a different approach to this discussion that I'm the king. And the way I did that was this. Uh, she calls herself a princess. She says, I'm Princess Evie. Sometimes she'll say that. Sometimes she won't say that. But, but she said that the other night. And I says, well, you know what that makes? You know what that makes me? She said, no, what's that? I said, that makes me the king. She said, oh, really? I mean, she was interested in that. I said, yes, your mother is a princess and you're a princess. And so the father of a princess is a king. And so she said, King Daddy Pop. So that, I like that. I, I kind of attached myself to that. Well, her, her mother rolled her eyes at the whole concept of that thing. Uh, now, he said, what does this silly story have to do with this discussion? Well, I think it has everything to do with this discussion because Paul takes up what a child's life is like in the family in that culture. Uh, a child really is about a step behind the slaves. Uh, they have no authority whatsoever, really. They go where they're told. They do as is just as they're they're told uh they uh they get up when they're told they they just have no real authority and it's not even the father that's necessarily telling them that it's the managers and uh, the guardians that are giving them their instructions and so paul describes the life of a, a jewish person under the law just like that as a child who's bound by what he describes as the elementary, elementary principles of the world. Now, uh, if I could, let me, let me pull up some of, this, uh, some of this text. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Paul kind of places it on equal ground. Go back in your mind for just a second to the prodigal story in Luke, the 15th chapter. Uh, go back with me to the pigsty, feeding the swine, hungry, famished, and he begins to reflect upon his life in that condition. Remember that? And, and he says, ah, he has a, one of those light bulb moments. Ah, I have an idea. I've sinned against my father, and he did. He acknowledged him, his uh, being at the bottom of the barrel, being his own fault, his own faulty decision-making, uh, he had, had hurt his father. All of those things 
I think that he understood in in all honesty with himself. Finally, for the first time in a very long time, he began to reflect upon his condition. And he says, I know what I'll do. And he got his story. This is what he was going to rehearse. Uh, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I've sinned against you in heaven above. I'm no longer worthy to be to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. You see, in that condition, life as a servant in his father's household. Now, this wasn't even a slave. This is this is one who's even higher on the totem pole than a than a, an indentured slave would be in that in that culture. Uh, make me as one of your hired servants. He saw that as uh, preferable uh, completely to what his condition of life was in that moment. Of course, the father exalts him, restores him to his position, and we rejoice uh, in the grace of, of the father in that story. But this shows that kind of the, uh, the uh, totem pole, as it were, of authority in that Near East culture. All right. And so a child is no different, Paul says, from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Luke, Lucas, there's another part of that story I didn't tell you. I asked you why you didn't drive. You weren't invited to drive. You might be able to do it. You don't have a license. All of those things you said. But, but the part that I didn't clue you in on is that one day all of the cars, even the Porsche maybe, would be yours. One of these days, long time from now. Um, uh, that's what the text is saying, that he owns everything, but not yet, not yet. There's a lot of water that has to pass under the bridge before any of that. So now I'm sorry, I've maybe created a lot of problems for y'all now that I think about this is not the smartest line of uh, discussion. Um, Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under a guardian and a manager until the father says when. You see, that was the, the, the real egregious part of that prodigal story was that that boy, when he says, give me my inheritance, was tantamount to saying, I wish you were dead. Um, that's a terrible thing, isn't it? Um, and so the, the child is under a guardian and a manager until the father says when. Now, notice what Paul says in that illustration in the same way. Uh, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elemental principles of the world. Now, maybe that's given you, so the King James says, elemental spirits uh, of the world. Some of your other versions might say something kind of akin to that. What he means is that we were governed by this authority of the elementary, elementary precepts that govern life, the world of a Jew. Now, it comes from a, from a Greek term, which really is anything in a series. It, it was originally used to describe men marching in line. You ever do that when you're in the military, or maybe you did it in the school line, everybody marched in line. It's the first one in line. Well, it's also emblematic, came to be used to describe just basic things like one, two, three, or A, B, C. Um, when you were a child, You were governed by, you were enslaved to the ABCs of life under that. That's what life for you was like when you were a child living under the law. But, he says, when the fullness of time had come, that is when God said when, when God said when, Uh, He sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. Now, this is important. Born of woman. This is a fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The offspring of woman. uh, Born under the law of Moses. The descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To redeem those who were under the law. Those are Jews. So that we might receive adoption as sons. Sons of whom? In this context, Abraham's sons. Now, these are the descendants of those that walk in his footsteps. We talked about that this morning in in Romans, the fourth chapter, didn't we? Uh, These are the descendants of those who are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. They've inherited the promise that was made to Abraham that in you all nations of the earth will be blessed. Jew and Gentile, all nations, Jew and Gentile. All right. So when God said when, then... 
You had the power to no longer be a child enslaved to the elemental spirits or elemental principles uh, of or precepts of the world, rather that you could receive adoption as sons. To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. In essence, the spirit that, that was in Christ as a son of God, who had the nearness to the Father's ear, that he could cry out in this most enduring expression, Abba, Father, that's the most endearing expression that a son could have toward the Father. That has been set forth into your hearts today. So, you are no longer a slave. Slave to what? Slave to the elemental principles of the of the law or of the world as a Jew. The ABCs, you're no longer uh, governed the way that you were under that. But now you are a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Those things that were all yours in promise are now yours in reality. All right. Uh, that's where we are. Now, I want to talk about this idea of being redeemed, uh, to redeeming those who were under the law. He's talking to this Jewish brethren here, uh, to those who, have, who were Jews who've become Christians. He's talking about both aspects of forgiveness, the forgiveness that the Jewish nation enjoyed when they came to Christ, uh, coupled with the, the forgiveness that the Gentile world received. All of these things go back to what he's just taught us, as many of you, as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. So ancestral heritage, uh, social standing, gender, none of those things are parameters uh, in, uh, in the gospel or in Christ. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to his promise. He has redeemed those who were unto the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Here this passage is talking about the Jews. And because you are sons, God has sent this spirit, uh, this endearing spirit into your heart that you share with his son Jesus. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. All right, so we are now heirs. All right, let's move forward into verse 8 now. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. Um, I think that there is a couple of ways to understand this. He's talking about those who were lived uh, formerly as though there were no God at all. What was their God? Well, everything was their God. There was a God of the uh, of the of the trees, there was a God of the sea, there was a God of the uh, God of the, the water sources, so forth. You get the idea. But there were no gods at all. You were enslaved uh, to those to those things that were not gods. But now he says that you have come to know God. Rather, you've come to be known by God. Uh, I don't think Paul is necessarily correcting himself when he says that you've come to know God or rather be known by God, he's really saying two things. Um, they have come to, maybe you can relate to this, the point that you came to a realization that you've been completely wrong in your worldview, completely wrong. Uh, and the Gentile world was much like that. Uh, they looked at what we now call mythology. They saw that these various gods were in control of everything and they came to realize, hold it, there is one God that governs all of these things. He's our creator. Uh, and this was Paul's line of thinking in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts when he talked to the Greeks or to the, to the, the men of Athens. Um, or rather to be known by God. That is that you are now the children of God. And he asked this question. And this is the critical question of this entire context. How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary ABCs of the world? Why would you do that? Jew or Gentile, why would you do that? Whose slaves you want to be once more. 
Why would you turn back and do that? Here's what it's saying, Lucas. It's saying once you've got all of these things that you now have this liberty and the freedom that you say, oh, you know what? I think I, I think I'm going to go back. You may feel like this one day when you're about 60 years old. I wish I could go back and live mom and dad's house and not have all this responsibility anymore. Um, that's not going to be possible, is it? Why would a Jew choose that? More than that, why would they compel a Gentile to do that? Why would they do that? Makes no sense at all, does it? No sense whatsoever. Um, why would children return to the guardian once they have uh, the inheritance in hand? Why would they do that? Well, the answer to that question is that they would not they would not do that um, I didn't put this slide up but we're going to look at the next two verses and this will give us an opportunity to kind of bring our thoughts to a conclusion tonight uh, Paul points out some evidence that that's what's happening here uh, among the churches of Galatia for a couple of reasons comfort uh, it's what they're comfortable with what they know uh, you know new uh, is not always the most comfortable thing. Uh, how many of you really struggled when your employer brought uh, in a computer and put it on your desk and said, here? You struggle with that a little bit? That was a turning point, wasn't it? Um, and, and believe it or not, I, I lived in a world before computers. And, and so that was kind of, I saw some of my friends having computers at home. And I remember I used to think, oh my goodness, I don't want anything to do with that. That looks like a big waste of time. Well, I was right. It's a big waste of time. Uh, you can waste a lot of time, but it's become a necessary instrument, hasn't it? Um, and, and change is trying. And to some degree, I think uh, grace was required on the part of, uh, um, of teachers like Paul. Uh, certainly the Lord showed uh, Israel or showed the Jewish people grace as they came to him. That's evidenced by the fact that uh, the Lord allowed them to be able to live this dual existence under the law for about 40 years. And then he destroyed their ability to be a Jew by destroying their ability to make the appearance at the temple starting at age 12. And they no longer were able to do that. Uh, and, and everything changed. And certainly the Lord was, was fully in control of when that happened on the day that he said when. They stopped being able to have that ability. But, uh, but change is difficult. And so you can understand how some of them really struggled. Uh, others, others had a little bit more sinister motives. Uh, they liked the power and the control that that gave them over people who were not like them. The Judaizers were, were motivated. Many of them were not motivated out of just this, this failure to, uh, or this, this uncomfortable feeling that they had. Their motive was far different. Their motive was the, the, the need to make Gentiles look like themselves, eat like themselves, worship like themselves, and all of that. And if they wouldn't, then they couldn't be part of the family. That's just kind of how their, what their attitude was. And that is wholly foreign to anything that was authorized in Scripture. And so Paul pointed out some evidence that this was what was happening. And he cites very clearly his concern in verse 11. He says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. Now, what were some of the days that they observed? How about the Sabbath day? in the way that it had been observed in the past. Uh, the months, uh, the month of Abib, for instance, the day of, uh, uh, of uh, Passover and the observance of Passover, that a Gentile would be compelled to stake their lamb or their goat for four days and observe it, uh, to put on their clothes and pretend that they were departing uh, out of Egypt and to eat the food standing up through the Passover Seder meal uh, and so forth. 
Uh, that, that's an absurdity, isn't it? That a Gentile would need to do that. But that was what was being compelled. They were being compelled in many respects to proselyte as they had as, uh, as Jews. Made no sense at all, did it? The seasons, the years, and so forth. And we could kind of go through and describe some of the things that Jews were compelled to do. Paul says, you're... You're returning to the elementary spirits, the ABCs of, the, of your world as a Jew. And so I am afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. Paul says, you're in danger of really subverting all that you've been taught. And he pointed to these simple evidences of, of the existence of, of, of these things, the practice of these things among them. Uh, as evidence that they were, well, they were really on a fool's errand to return to these elementary spirits that governed their lives when they were children before the father said when and sent his son to redeem the world. That's a pretty clever argument, isn't it? That's a pretty clever section of this passage. It deals pointedly with Judaism, uh, or excuse me, the Judaizer uh, in in, first, in the first century church. Um, now, we'll pick up there uh, in uh, verse 12 uh, next Sunday night, if we can. Are there any questions or perhaps something that's occurred to you that you'd like to, to share, to, to, to vocalize before we stop? All right. I want you to notice from our um, discussion uh, this evening the day that the Father said when. Uh, this is an interesting phrase. When the fullness of time had come. Uh, our minds, if we were in, in a Hollywood film, might uh, go back to one of these flashbacks where we, we have all of these images of all of these promises and all of these things that God has foretold. It'd go all the way back to the garden paradise when Adam and Eve transgressed God's law. And he says, in the seed of woman, I'm going to overcome the devil. I'm going to deal the, the, or give the crushing blow to his head. Uh, he'll bruise his heel, but he's going to, he's going to bruise the head of the serpent. It'd go back to the promise that God made to Abraham that in your seed, Paul dealt with that in chapter three, is of one seed, one son, seed, son, uh, all nations of the earth would be blessed. He describes that as the gospel. It would go back to, to the prophet's announcements of the coming Messiah of that day, of the beginning of the kingdom. It'd go back to the, the vision of, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon a long time ago when Daniel comes and describes the blow that's going to be dealt to the nations as they're broken in pieces and consumed uh, by the kingdom of God, by the eternal kingdom of God. All of these images would come to mind. When the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son. Uh, it's evidenced in the language of the prophets in the days of these kings. And it's no accident that Luke, the second chapter, uh, describes the, the time of Caesar Augustus. It tells us what kings, the fourth world empire from Babylon. If you don't remember that, just watch the Peanuts uh, Christmas show when he reads Luke chapter 2. Linus does or recites Luke the second chapter. It's a beautiful scene, little image of the promise that God, that God made. When the fullness of time is come, God sent forth his son. Born of woman, born under the law as a Jew to redeem those who were under the law. Everything that God was doing was bound up in this, that Christ would come to the world to buy us back from sin and slavery. He would give himself to pay the price that we could never pay for ourselves, so that we could be the children of God. Paul uses the masculine side of this, but he's describing us as the children of God. Would you be a child of God tonight? Would you afford yourself of the great power that is brought to bear against sin by the redemptive blood of the Son of God? Would you do that? 
If you're a child of God and you're struggling in some way, on what grounds would you return to the elementary spirits of the ABCs of living in this world? Why would we do that? It offers us no hope. Only the saving uh, gift that Christ gave us is, uh, is worth living for. And if we can help you with that, we'd invite you to come right now while together we stand and while we sing. To follow Jesus. If there were those who were unable to participate or partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, and you would like to do so now, if you'll if you raise your hand. We'll, do you have the emblem, sir? Let's pray together. Our dear Father, we're so thankful for the sacrifice of your Son, that he paved the way for us and offered us salvation through his blood. Father, we pray we would direct our minds and our hearts to his suffering and to his love that he showed us. Perfect sacrifice, the sinless Lamb of God. We may, may we honor him in the way that we partake and the way that we live. We ask that you would forgive us of our sins. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. Again, Father, we ask you to bless us if we partake of this cup, symbolically representing the blood of our Savior that washes away the sins of the world, that he gave so freely that we might have hope of redemption. Father, we ask you once again that we might partake in a way that honors him and, and that we might remember him and the love that he showed us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to come together and study another portion from your word and sing songs of praise to you. Let us apply what we've learned in our everyday life to better serve you. Thank you, for, Father, for this beautiful day you have given us and all of its many blessings because we know, Father, that all blessings come from you. Thank you for the teachers that help the children to have a better understanding of you and to let your light shine through them in their daily walk of life. And we are also thankful for this congregation and how much we can encourage each other. Be with the ones that are going through various health concerns and bring them back to a good state of health if it would be your will, Father. Most of all, thank you for your son and the sacrifice he made for us. 
so that we could have everlasting life. Be with us, guide us, and strengthen us as we go about our daily lives and forgive us of our sins. In your son's holy name, amen.